When the Civil War ended in 1865, let's picture what the scene looked like. Much of the South had been destroyed. Industry was in ruins. The railroads had been demolished, first by the Confederates and then by the Union troops, each making strategic moves to try to win the war. But now, as the war was over, the resulting landscape was utterly bleak. There was one group of Southerners, though, who were filled with hope. For African Americans, this was a time of extreme optimism. Freed from the bondage of slavery, they sought not just freedom, but equality, and they were willing to work hard to get it. Even though the war was over, the country's divisions were far from healed. How were North and South to come together again after finding themselves lethal enemies? Should the former Confederates be punished as traitors for having taken up arms against the United States? Or should they be welcomed back into the Union as if they had done no wrong? This political cartoon mocked Lincoln and Johnson, showing them intent on repairing the Union to make it seem as if no damage had occurred. Both presidents envisioned the South's return with very little punishment for the actions they had taken during wartime. Reconstruction presented a time of great hope and opportunity. The nation could be rebuilt from the ground up. From the nation's founding, slavery had marred the ideals of liberty, freedom, and independence. Here was a chance to begin again as a nation truly made up of free men and free women. But much of the possibility and opportunity presented by Reconstruction would be squandered. It would be wasted by politicians intent on furthering their own careers and by voters who were too selfish to look beyond their own narrow interests. And while slavery might have ended, racism, of course, had not, and it would poison the country for the next hundred years, blocking the efforts of many African Americans to achieve success. At first, though, it appeared that Reconstruction would be effective. African Americans wanted several key advances. For one, they wanted land, so that they could farm and be self-sufficient. They also wanted education, since teaching slaves to read and write had been illegal in much of the South before the war. They wanted to control their own independent churches, and they wanted the legal right to marriage and children, rights to protect their families that they had been denied under slavery. After the war, Congress passed the Freedmen's Bureau Bill. The Bureau would send agents into the South to build schools and hospitals and to distribute food. African Americans also wanted political equality. With the passage of the 15th Amendment, universal male suffrage was achieved. All men were entitled to vote, regardless of race. African Americans participated in politics with enthusiasm, forming political clubs, and educating themselves and each other in record numbers. Voter participation was high in the African American community. Although this right would quickly be taken away, while it was in place, men were proud to vote and to participate in the political process. This was also a time for enthusiastic political service within the African American community. Overall, during Reconstruction, over 2,000 African American men would hold political office, whether in local politics or in the nation's Senate. After Reconstruction's end in 1877, such participation would grind to a halt. As African American men gained the right to vote, some white feminists began to ask why they were now lagging behind in this struggle for political rights. Those women who had supported abolition were now watching uneducated African-American men vote while they still could not. The movement for women's rights would split over this issue. Frederick Douglass, the escaped slave and abolitionist activist who had long supported women's rights, called upon feminists to be patient. While African-American men needed the right to vote first, he cautioned, in order to build the economic and political strength of the African-American community, women's rights would soon follow. Even as African-Americans began to achieve political rights and envision a hopeful future for themselves, backlash began. 
no sooner had the war ended than the Ku Klux Klan was formed. Having their first formal meetings in early 1866, the Klan targeted Republicans in the South. Both African Americans and their white supporters found themselves victims of the group's violence. The Klan would disrupt political meetings, beat and murder activists, and prevent African American men from exercising their right to vote. For a time, the federal government would shut down the Klan with the KKK Act of 1871, arresting and trying hundreds of Klansmen. Soon, though, they would turn their back on the South, refusing to control the Klan or other white supremacist groups. The end of Reconstruction came suddenly, but it had been slowly ending almost since it had begun. The formal end of Reconstruction occurred in 1877, when President Hayes removed the last federal troops from the South and declared Reconstruction over, as part of the deal he had struck to win the presidency in the contested election of 1876. But the Freedmen's Bureau had already devolved into a labor bureau, brokering contracts between former slaves and former slave owners, contracts that were very prejudicial against the laborers. Working for low wages, or no wages, sometimes on the very plantations where they had been enslaved before the war, many African Americans questioned where their hopes of equality had gone. Here, in a cartoon of the Panic of 1873, we see another major reason for the end of Reconstruction. As Northerners worried increasingly about their own financial and political concerns, they grew tired of supporting the South. Increasingly, they turned their back on the region, leaving most African Americans in a society where they enjoyed few rights and little equality. <laughs> 